Hey guys, welcome to an episode that I have been promising you for a really long time. And it's not about that crow in the background. It is about what I'm calling junk arch tops or cheap arch tops. Um, you know, when you're building roots instruments, which is really what we're doing, um, there's a reason why people started having those. Um, and there's a reason why we ultimately are going to progress to um, real guitars if we keep in this business of building stuff out of junk. And a stopping point along the way because of the type of music that's being played is going to be an arch top guitar. This is the first one I ever got. It's an airline. It was made for Montgomery Wards. It would have come out around Christmas. We'll get into more of that in a bit. But anyway, arch tops have a sides a top and bottom and when they're put together if you could look at this from the inside you would see that this is concave if it's flipped over um, and the back as well so they come up and that's why they call them arch tops they typically have a trapeze tailpiece and a floating bridge that you can adjust with screws uh, they have a neck and sometimes that can be problematic but we're going to take a look at these things and figure out a little bit of their history and ultimately end up with kind of a framework of some problems you might look for if you're thinking about getting into one of these. There is an allure that goes with this that sometimes leaves you with $500 into a $200 guitar. So I'm going to go through that and then this episode will for, um, serve as a framework for following episodes that tell you how to fix some of the things that you find with these typically uh, and what to do with one that's just not worth the money that it is touted to be worth. So, let's start off with a little bit of history. Let's start off with the matchbook of the episode. It's one of the oldest matchbooks I have. It's Royal Crown Cola. Now, you might have heard me say this before, but Furry Lewis, um, who was a slide guitar player, um, and recorded some stuff around 1927, used a Royal Crown Cola bottle for a slide. This is a Royal Crown Cola bottle from about the time that Furry was rediscovered in the 60s and played uh, about that time. But if you look at this bottle, in comparison to this bottleneck, which slips on uh, pretty easily here, this one not so much. And this will tell you a lot about the stature of Furry Lewis. Anyway, moving along, let's look at what was important to musicians who were playing the blues about the time Furry Lewis was first recorded, again in the late 20s and going into the 30s. Let's have a look at what guitars look like then. Before we get to looking at uh, specific guitars here, I'm going to call your attention to something you might have noticed already but never figured out you did. If you listen to Reuben Lacey, or Sun House or Charlie Patton, you're going to hear um, uh, a um, vocal style that sounds more like Clark Griswold singing oh, Christmas carols like that. And so what the music was about then, remember there was no amplification, and so it was about playing house parties. There was no Metallica tour, uh, there were no stadium hair bands. This was people who were typically workers playing a little music or people that were smart enough to play a little guitar and then follow everybody around to payday and then go to house parties. So the music back then was about projection, projecting your voice and projecting on your guitar. If you could not do either simultaneously, the noise of the house party would go away, everybody's hitting the moonshine and you basically didn't have any gigs. So it was about projection, both in voice and guitar. Okay guys, the choice back then was this puppy, one like it. A steel body guitar because they're tough. Uh, you don't have roadies, you don't have cases, you're just basically toting a guitar around and these things were tough um, and they projected well. This is not a, um, an old guitar, it's fairly new, but when we start talking about pro projection, from the instrument, these things resonated really well. Now notice they're not an arch top, they are a flat top, but so 
they made good noise, and especially when you start hammering on them, you'll see Sunhouse and in his movies from the 60s where he was playing one of these uh, when they found him again. You see him just slapping these things and beating on these things. So these things would project really well. These were $35 up to about $50, depending on how the setup was, about 1930. So that's pretty cheap, right? Wrong. Because the inflation rate, if you get an inflation calculator, it will tell you that something that was worth $35 in 1930 is now about $530. So, economy of scale. You can hear my voice resonating back out of this thing. That's pretty cool. But So, the idea that they were cheap, not true. So, you would have had to have uh, quite a bit of money to be able to get one of these back then. Um, I think the word cheap has gone from including um, a low cost to low quality, and I don't think you see the, those in uh, this type of instrument. Now, there was another option available besides a flat top uh, back then or an acoustic guitar. These were all acoustic guitars. Remember, there were no pickups, there was no amplification. And it was like this one. This is an arch top. And so, you could do this. So, this will project fairly well too. Not like this one, but it's an arch top. It's got trapeze, floating bridge. Look at this, this is a Bakelite bridge. It's not a wooden rosewood bridge. Um, so, what's the difference between these two instruments? One of them is actually period correct of about between 1927 and 1933, and it's this one. Archcraft. I've seen these around. They're fairly rare. People are saying, oh, it was built by K. No, not built by K. Anytime you see a Bakelite bridge, that's an indicator that we're not talking about 60s and 50s. We're getting back. Now, I like this guitar. Um, it's got some issues, and you're going to see it in an episode later, but um, this was the next best thing to this back then. Okay, before we set these aside, the obvious question is, why would somebody have one of these instead of one of these? Well, National Guitar was not running around uh, setting up what is the equivalent of Guitar Center Sam Ash music back then. You kind of took what you got. Um, and furthermore, where this guitar was between $35 and $50 or $60, you could get one like this for $20. In today's prices, again, $530, almost $200. So I want you to think about, you're talking about just before the Depression or during the Depression, you're talking about sharecropper people, you're talking about day laborers, and you're talking about how do you put the money together to get one of these, even if it's the cheap one. So again, had nothing to do with quality per se. I mean the quality of this one, um, if you're the honky-tonk man and you want to smash a guitar over somebody's head in fake wrestling, you'll do this one. If you want to hit somebody and hurt them, it's this one. <laughs> but hey, that was good, huh? So at the end of the day, neither one of these were really cheap by the economic standards of the day. So how did we get from this to what we do? this. So the answer is economics. It's strictly economics. We can consider ourselves Renaissance people, men, whatever pronouns at the bottom of your email um, today, but it's just economics. And why this style of music? Well, no one who was a sharecropper had access to symphonies, pretty much, uh, so you wouldn't hear them trying to make a Stratasbury's guitar out of a coffee can. That it, It's all about the type of music that was being played at the time. So, I have talked to people, one of them, Robert Kimbrough, that told me his first, very first guitar was made out of a cigar box. So, remember the economics of the time. Did someone have $535 or $200? Well, probably not. 
So how did they get an instrument? Well, you would make one. You might find guitar pieces, you might find pegs, you might find... I've seen all kinds of relic instruments, and I'm going to give you a link to a book below about relic instruments. You want to get it. It's probably the best book that shows you how to hand make uh, stuff without having access to MGB or CB Giddy for all these parts that we use. Okay, so the book I'm talking about, the link below, is the Folk Art Instrument Builders Reference by Charles E. Atchison. This is a great book. I've had it for a couple of years. It walks you from the most simple things where, again, you don't have access to these parts. So you're carving stuff with a pocket knife and putting things together on a body that um, could be anything. And, um, and it goes all the way up through simple piezos and wiring and things like that. So, hey, Charles E. Atchison, thank you for this book. Again, link below. Yeah, so we've come a long way in our hobby. Well, we're actually starting from a place where, kind of the same place. Are you going to go out today, considering you don't even play a guitar, some of us, maybe even most of us, are you going to run out and, in your progression and buy a national from 1930 that's going to cost you five or $6,000? Or maybe even a new Gretsch or, or, or Recording King or something like that? No, we start getting fancy and we start doing license plate stuff. And notice that some of us like to make things look period correct while others are about the box and the, and the tone wood and all that kind of stuff. There's a reason that they call my stuff junk pile guitars because yeah they're junk face it nothing you build today is going to meet the quality of a national steel body guitar i'm sorry i don't care how good you are but yeah i'm fancy because i can do all this and i'm a renaissance person or whatever or a folk artist or something you know what if you stay with this very long and start building these guitars a couple things could happen you start mass producing them, which is really hard for me because my stuff is individual. I build it for people. If 20 people are running at you and bum rushing you every time you do a concert in a town, you're probably going to pick the guitar to play. If you ever play a guitar that's given to you on stage by A, being durable, and B, being unique to you. And so you're going to invest the time to learn how to play it and maybe use it in a show or record something and that's where my success has been but the longer you blow these out one after another you're going to burn out to the point where you're doing Route 66 Elvis and Vegas guitars and then your passion is gone so at some point you're going to progress and I guarantee you that this progression will take you to one of these why because it's about the blues music again Nobody figured that they're going to get to the Philadelphia or Los Angeles Symphony Orchestra by playing a coffee can. This was about the blues and the sounds that these guitars make. So, when you get here, what are you going to find? Well, sometimes at the end, you find yourself in an empty wallet because the allure of these things, they're around, um, which speaks to a couple of things. Number one, they... Uh, there was a profuse number made. They were a great Christmas present, especially if you're upset with your brother or you didn't like his wife. You would just get one of these for a kid and then you would, um, they would try and play it and drive everyone crazy and it would end up in its chipboard case up in the attic where we find it 50 years, 60, 70 years later and go, wow, this is a real find. Well, it's been through hot and cold and attic and basement and the wood is doing this and this and sometimes the first time you string them up pow the neck breaks loose so let's go to the bench and take a look at first what do these things look like inside how durable are they really and then let's walk through some problem areas that you're going to find that will make you wish you would have never spent the money you did on one of these things no matter how cool they are Hey guys, sorry, you know me, I can never get to the bench right away when I tell you I'm going to. So while I'm here, um, don't forget to give me a like below, subscribe. If you haven't, there's going to be a series of episodes that come off of these guitars I'm going to show you today with some of the problems they have or some of the strengths they have. 
um, and some of the attributes that we're going to use to figure out, do we want to make these things like they were, or is there some reason why we can just hot rod them up and make them into something else? Um, two episodes, for example, I did a recent episode called $3 Neck Reset that's got a lesson in here about the first thing we're going to talk about, link to it right up there. And then there's another guitar that's been stripped down that was in much better shape, um, but had some cosmetic issues and stuff that let me hot rod it up. And that was the Texas Junk Pile episode up there. Uh, both of them, there's learning lessons, and we're going to cover between um, the $3 neck reset and what to do with a better guitar. Anyway, if there's something you see on here along the way, and you want to call one of these guitars out and you have an interest in it particularly, um, some of them I'm going to individualize them pretty well. Um, and if you see something like, get a hold of me by email and let me know that something is interesting. So let's start off with this. Let's say I have a guitar that's in fairly solid condition. Um, and I'm looking at, it's got a couple little cosmetic issues, but other than that, it's okay. I might get the urge to put a pickup on it, hot rod it up, um, put a license plate on it for a pit guard to replace some stuff that's missing. Again, hot rod it up, put a piezo in it, put a pickup on it. But let's say, for example, I got one that seems to be the perfect candidate for that, that which is this Harmony mid-range model. It says steel reinforced neck, but there's no truss rod. The, the, the neck seems to be attached to the body okay. It's got a couple splits and stuff. I might be looking at that, but if I don't do my background, I might not know that Mississippi Hill Country Blues, 1967, George Mitchell, his book, look at that, Joe Calcott's on the front, and it's the same model guitar, exactly. So, oh, Joe Calcott, I think I'm going to give you a link below to an album that he did. Um, you know Kenny Brown? If you don't know Kenny Brown, you need to figure out Kenny Brown. Uh, but Kenny Brown was learning off this guy who lived right in the neighborhood with him when he was a small kid first learning how to play guitar. And I think it's safe to say that um, Kenny Brown, um, first off, before I forget, Kenny Brown and his wife Sarah put on the North Mississippi Hill Country picnic every year. But Kenny Brown was an influence on um, Luther Dickinson to some extent or another. Anyway, but again... I'm going to take a look at what you got and do a little history to find out is this something like this regardless of whether it's got a divot out of the neck or a crack or something like this. Okay. Now, let's get to the bench and we're going to look at how these things are put together and how inherently flimsy they are when pieces start to go bad. Alright guys, let's start by looking at how one of these is put together. We have a harmony a guitar here, uh, six string, truss rod. How can you tell if it has a truss rod? Well, it has a cover here, and if you take that off, um, there is a bolt that runs all the way down the neck. Let's zoom back out here so we can see um, how I've got this set up and make sure my camera angle is right. Anyway, it runs all the way down here, and what it allows you to do is tighten it up or loosen it, which bows the neck or straightens the neck. Or um, and so, if your string action gets weird, uh, that's the first thing you want to take a look at. Now, we come down into the body where the neck meets the body, and then on the inside we have a series of braces. And notice that. There is a piece right here that strengthens where the neck comes in and a piece back here that uh, is the tail block where the trapeze and your um, strap button and everything else goes to. But inside is kerfing and we talked about that in another episode but it's this stuff that has slots in it so when it's damp you can lay it inside the guitar and make the shape of the guitar and you also have bracing here that goes back and forth so when the side top and bottom are together and everything is solid here it's a pretty good structurally it's pretty good but look at this when I start taking the top off 
look at how things move around and bow around you see how much movement there is there so if you have cracks on the top cracks running down the body that kind of thing it's pretty bad now the neck is one of the first things we're going to talk about that joint and i've got another one here that we can look at just set that on top of there nothing's going to happen with these guitars other than they'll be firewood but you can see that the neck comes down and it's dovetailed right there and fits into that block now you look at this one there's a crack right there do you see that and what you want to look for in one of these things is the first thing you want to look for is is the neck separated right there right there that's the first thing you want to look for because if it's separated this is going to bow like this and your string action is going to get really heavy so if you're seeing stress cracks here or this separated here it's time to think about how much you're paying on the guitar but anyway that's how they look on the inside while we're talking about this if i get one of these guitars and i hear a rattling so i'm going to shake it a little bit if i hear a rattling i'm going to turn it upside down and see if i can get something to uh, pop out of one of the f holes if this is what comes out of the f holes other than a bunch of uh, uh, dust bunnies and stuff from being in the attic for a while but if you see this coming apart in pieces that means that this is deteriorating which means that your top is getting loose there's likely to be cracks and the structural integrity integrity blah 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 rented lifts of the guitar is coming into question because without the sides the top is worthless the next thing to think about is getting a mirror and a flashlight or using your phone with the flashlight on you want to look at these braces if you hear something rattling and these braces are cutting loose in here typically on the ends or there's pieces of bracing coming off that's not good that's where you start ending up with splits along the body and that type of thing and without these in place um, remember the episode I did click the eye up there it tells you about um, Wait a minute, I did that episode after, so about right up, let me get this pointer up here in the right spot, right up there, right about now, is repairing a split body. Um, it talks about that, but these braces need to be okay. So if this neck is cutting loose, and the braces or the, the kerfing is coming apart, you really want to ask yourself, why are you looking at paying $150 or $200 for something like this? Oh, next thing. What am I buying? Oh, look at this one. Silvertone. Most desirable of all of them. Made by K for Sears and Roebuck. Let's zoom out and walk down this thing. The other zoom out, please. There we go. Zoom all the way out. And let's walk down. Everything, ooh, everything looks pretty good. The finish is okay. See this stuff right here? It's called binding. The binding is solid. The body does not seem to be split. This fly is going to die, die. Uh, the floating bridge is okay. The tail piece is okay. No cracks or anything. Looks great. Um, let's take a look at the neck. Oh, neck doesn't seem to be cut loose. Um, there's supposed to be a piece of wood in there. That's kind of missing. So when that's missing, we want to take a look at where this comes together and see if there's any stress cracks there. Ooh, little one there. But the rest of the fingerboard and everything seems to be okay. This is a choice instrument, right? Well, kind of. Let's take a look at the quality of this one in comparison to the quality of others. Ooh, check this one out. Clean one owner. There's no brand name up here on the neck, um, but who knows what happened there. Um, if you zoom out, ooh, we got the other zoom out right away this time. We go down the neck. Everything looks good. Body looks great. Look at that. No cracks, no anything. Ooh, I like this one, right? Well, a couple indicators of something here. Look there is no binding no binding and now when we start turning it up here let's get the camera angle right 
string action's kind of high, but what do you see? There is no gap here, um, and the neck is starting to cut loose a little bit right there. You see that? And the neck is actually, the fingerboard is actually very thin, right? Um, this is kind of a student instrument of the time. And so what appears to be a really cool looking guitar is actually a very low end model of a knockoff of, I mean, when you start knocking off silver tones and stuff, you're kind of getting at the bottom end of the barrel. So this one is a good candidate for a slide um, guitar and hot rodding it up and putting pickups on it and stuff because it will look nice, but at the end, it's not that uh, high quality of an instrument. Okay, now on the other end of the scale, so we've got the student instrument first, then the silver tone we saw. Now let's hop up to the upper end of this kind of guitar. This is a Harmony Monterey. It has a truss rod. Um, it's in great shape, but you can tell by looking at this right away from uh, the fret markers and everything and how it's put together that this is a much, much better instrument. We've got the floating bridge. We've got the trapeze. Let's go take a look at the stuff we have. Notice the fret markers are very clear. There's nothing cutting loose here. Uh, that board that we're looking for, that piece right there is there. This is a good, solid instrument. Now, it has its issues, and we're going to talk about that in the middle. Uh, or in a little bit, excuse me, but at the end of the day, just remember there is a lot of room in between finding a student instrument, a lower end silver tone or airline, and something like along the lines of a Harmony Monterey. Okay, guys, here's everybody's green, dream guitar, right? It is a Sears Silvertone. I showed you this one before. Let's zoom in on that a little bit so you can see what it is. Everything looked good on this, remember? Um, the string action was okay. Everything's fine. Um, body doesn't have any cracks. Tailpiece seems to be great. Um, binding is good, but... Let's turn this around for a second and have a look. You notice that neck right there? You see it? Got a little bit of a split right there. So it's starting to work loose. So what do you do with that? Okay, so when the neck is popping loose like that right there, you want to remember that if the neck pivots that way, the string action is going to go up the further you get down the fretboard and that's going to throw your intonation off and when it starts moving this way inertia says that it will continue to move that way so how do you fix it well i've got a neck off of one of these things and you see how it's pivoted there and this fits down into the dovetail, dovetail joint we were talking about but if this is starting to pivot up like this it only makes sense that you would work this loose, heat up the heat, the hide glue, and we've talked about that, and then you would shave this, which allows uh, this to come up. So you're basically taking wood off here or here, and then getting it to sit right, and there's a relationship between the gap here and what needs to happen up here. So this gets expensive. It's called a neck reset. There's another way to go about it, and that other way to go about it is this. You see that? Look right there. Somebody has run a screw into the neck, drilled a hole, run a screw into the neck to stabilize the movement here so it doesn't get any worse and screwed into the block. This also could be a spot where you had a strap button. This is called a poor man's neck reset. If you see this, the instrument is worth far less right away and regardless of what this looks like in terms of overall quality this is one that you can hot rod up and not worry about ruining the value now you know that sooner or later regardless of the quality all of these are going to have a neck issue at some point or another so neck reset poor man's neck reset done already 
bad news in terms of value. On the other side of the coin, if you run across a neck that's been reset, and there's evidence of that, that a luthier shop has done it, and um, you've got a receipt for it, now we're talking about a much better instrument. And then, of course, it, it all involves what the rest of the instrument was from the beginning, ranging from a student guitar all the way down or up to the top end. Okay, the next thing I want to talk to you about is the bridge, the floating bridge on this thing. And again, this is that Harmony that is the same model as at the front of the book uh, that George Mitchell did about uh, the Hill Country Blues in 1967. But let's put that down and have a closer look here. I want you to look at that bridge and how it sits on top of the top of the guitar. What you want to look for here is, are there any gaps here? Um, is there air in, any air showing underneath there? Has the thing been changed? Can you look here and see? Let me grab my pointer. I know you guys aren't used to my fingers anymore, but where are we? Right there. Do you see that that's uh, tilt? Do you see a lighter spot there or over there? Is the bridge tilted? Um, meaning the angle of it. Because sometimes people will do that if one of the... Of the strings isn't intonating correctly you can change this by moving this up or down or this or that way and fine tune it sometimes you'll see that but if you see that the wood color is different here a different shade that may be an indicator that the bridge has been changed and why is that a problem well it all depends on if this right here if there's air underneath there that's not good you want to remember that if if uh, somebody put a bridge on this it was sanded down to be to fit this arch top not all of these arch tops are exactly the same so if I go ahead and change the bridge on here and I have air under here that means that the load on the bridge and on the arch top is not even and equalized and if I start putting pressure say right here you can see which way the grain runs on this top right so I change the pressure that this thing has been under for years or I put on new strings or heavier strings or something like that and there's air gaps here that takes the load of the bridge and puts it in one spot and the grain is running this way you will actually split the top out of a guitar doing that so always look at the bridge how it's sitting and whether there's evidence that it has been changed and if it has been well there's some there's some things you can do about that, and we'll cover that in an episode about bridges on arch tops. Okay, this is a different guitar. This is a U.S. Strad. It looks like a pretty good guitar, so let's go to the bridge on this one. Is there any evidence of sh shadowing or shading that says that the bridge has been moved? No, it might be the original bridge, um, but when we look at it, what do you see? Ooh, look at that. Thumb screws turned all the way up. Um, it's riding as high as it can go. In fact, the bridge is pitching forward. You see that it's not straight up and down. So when we start looking at that, that tells us, look at the string action, very low. It touches uh, the frets without even putting a slide on it. That means that this bridge has been topped out and that is a bad sign. Now this guitar looks good. Um, it doesn't have any binding which kind of says it's a low-end model but there are no cracks or anything and everything looks pretty good but this one looks great but it's not worth that much so it's a candidate for being hot rotted up definitely look at the bridge all right back to our harmony monterey the top end model right truss rod great fret work great fret markers neck is fine Ooh, look at this bridge. This is kind of interesting. It's adjustable. So those inter intonation problems that you might be able to fix by turning the bridge and tilting it, you don't need to worry about that. You can not only adjust the height of the individual strings, but where they meet the bridge. So I can move this forward and back. Each one of these is adjustable. That is a really, really nice bridge. Well, guess what? It's not the original bridge. These things didn't come with roller bridges. And look, there's a little gap right there underneath there. Trust me on that. So, 
this guitar came out of a luthier shop. I traded it, uh, and it's nice. It plays nice and everything, but that right there says that this guitar has been reworked, and when something on it's been reworked, you want to take a look at the rest of it. I wouldn't tear this one up and hot rod it because the body's good. Everything is good on it. It's got nice binding. It's got the binding is very fancy. Uh, I think they call that purling or something like that when you put a couple rows of accent there. But this whole thing looks good. But again, the bridge will tell you everything as to whether or not the guitar has had work. All right. Um, isn't it funny how things are going to work out here? Here's our oldest guitar, the Archcraft. And let's take a look at the bridge on this one. Look. It's Bakelite. It's period correct. It's not cranked up. It's not tilted. There are no shadows. Everything is wonderful. String action on this one, great. Neck, fine. The bridge on this one tells us very little work has been done on this. Is this the one that we want to keep period correct and not hot rod up? So that will take us into our next area of how is the body and that's probably the biggest thing once you get past the things you can't fix and there may be a surprise about this guitar in there okay now we're down into the body you remember how flimsy these things are when the top and bottom and the sides quit working together you start getting a lot of flex in the neck you start getting a lot of things so if your bridge isn't on there uh, to create some cracks and stuff. Now you just want to look at the body and I think our Sears Silvertone got good tuners. They can be lubricated up. Neck is fine. All this looks great. Remember it's the one that had the poor man's neck reset but there are no cracks and the binding right here. So what happens here is when they put the sides and the top and bottom together, there's a little channel right there. And that channel is as wide and tall as the binding here. And so all that is solid. Uh, this is a good one to keep it as, as it is. It might even be worth doing a real neck reset on. Let's take a look at a couple of the other ones we've seen and compare. Okay, this is the Monterey that we, um, we saw here, the same model here on George Mitchell's book. Um, and it's got a it's got a gouge out of it um, right there a little bit of stuff on the fingerboard but the tuners are okay everything's okay the neck is fine um, but check this out the top is breaking loose from the sides on the back side you got a couple of cracks there um, it looks like this binding may have been painted on or it's very veneer thin but what are we going to do with this one? Well, considering it was on there and considering I'm going to make a rack for it and considering that I actually ordered a copy of the print from George Mitchell to be here any day, I'm going to make a, a wall hanger that's got the picture of this and this guitar on a stand. And, it, and this one is not one that I'm going to mess with. Now, I did an episode about repairing body splits and using suction cups, and I think you saw... Uh, that works successfully on both delamination bodies, delamination of bodies, and splitting of bodies um, in the episode called the um, Texas Junk Pile, and there's a link up there in the iCard, so check that out. But this one is not one that I'm interested in hot rotting up. I'm interested in keeping it in the family and hanging it on the wall and seeing this picture and, and uh reading the note that George Mitchell wrote to me about what it was like to do this in 1967. So this is one we're just going to make some light repairs and leave it the way it is. Okay, now here's a guitar that you want it to be okay, all right? Um, it's the Archcraft, made somewhere between 1927 and 1933 or so. We've looked at this one close, original nuts, okay. Fretboard's okay. Neck is okay. Um, and the bridge tells us that everything's good. There's no upper body cracks. But let's have a closer look. There's something really wrong here. Now, I've talked to you about kerfing, remember? That stuff that 
follows the guitar, it bends around on the inside, and it's what the top and bottom glue to. Guess where this come from? Yeah, right in there. So, this guitar was dropped. This part is broken, so we have a hole in the body. Not only do we have a hole in the body, but the body is shifting, and you can see that the kerfing is underneath there. And then the worst part about this guitar is the binding. See the binding here? It's deteriorating and coming undone, and because it is, look, when this guitar was dropped, not only did a piece of the body come off, but it started to crack all the way down into here. And that crack runs all the way over here. So we got a body crack. That's not too significant. But we've got this hole here. And no matter, no matter what we do, um, it's going to be obvious that it was there. So this part right here is not good. Um, when you're playing this guitar, this stuff hangs up on you and um, rubs against you and um, unfortunately this stuff is made out of something called celluloid not cellulite i'm not your fetish channel celluloid and it is about as bad as asbestos so when you're working on this it's going to become a health hazard if you just let it run and do whatever it is but um, we're going to do an episode on how we're going to fix this and that's to fix the binding you always want to leave the binding in place if you can because it, it's significant, but here and there everywhere and I got to fix this split and do all that kind of thing. But you see there's a channel right here so this body has to be shifted back where this is covered up and then the binding can be replaced with something more uh, um, appropriate environmentally and for your lungs and stuff. And I will do an episode on that, but in terms of the worst body, of all of them, unfortunately, it's the the oldest, period correct, and most valuable guitar. So you saw um, at the beginning that this thing uh, makes a lot of noise and resonates well, but I'm going to enjoy putting this one back together. All right, there we go. I really like this guitar. Um, you're going to see it in a in an episode. It's got a hole in the back. It's got binding work to do, and um, I think we talked about a little bit about that. But again, this was the framework for a series of episodes. It's going to talk to you about a little bit more in depth about some of these problems that you're going to run across if you're going to get into this stuff. So thanks for watching. Uh, I hope I didn't make you fat eating popcorn or whatever you've been doing while this. I appreciate your likes and I appreciate your subscriptions. And watch for details on the stuff we talked about today in later episodes. And I will see you later.